Brasil. Um, and uh, I'm going to have to do it like this because it's the only way to go. Um, I'm going backwards rather than forward. Um, so, uh, you have a tool that's awesome. Can you go up, 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 so now I'm going to exemplify everything that I mentioned to you. So I'm talking about experiential learning, learning by doing. So let's see what it looks like. Um, uh, okay, I asked you to do that, but I'm going back. Sorry about that. And um, so what does it look like? He said this. Here is a group of people that came from all over the world to study red screen to our faculty. So you got. Latin Americans, people from Islam, etc. We teach them how to do something pragmatic, how to do the numbers, right? That's the e-learning part. So I call it e-squared. We have e-learning and experiential learning. So then, after we're done with the numbers, we go to a solar factory. This is what a solar factory looks like. You got people making the devices in very sophisticated factories like that. And then we take them to see where the devices are being used, right? I mentioned to you that's a hockey arena, uh, school, and these brand new buildings that I was talking earlier, so I won't go there. But then we say, okay, can we do solar uh, charging of auto sharing vehicles? Right? I mentioned the share economy. So we start doing this type of thing with our graduate students. We need to exhibit the technology so we can get support for it, right? And what we're trying to do is what you already have in Burnaby, by the way. That's already in BCITs. Did you know that you got those things right here? Where do you think I got the idea from? <laughs> Not that smart. Um, and this, this slide's really important for the young people because look at these guys. Same spot, different poster, right? This is my time. This is my time, same spot. What happened? A year happened. Because good things take a heck of a lot of work. You can't do them in two days. Um, so then we went around looking in the university where to do these things. Um, you need to do what's called a solar access and shade report. And there's my students. Uh, that lady uh, used to work in Irina after working with us. The other guy, he's an Afghan. First one in his family, his name is Mustafa, to go to university. Mm -hmm. So they're using what I call the iPhone of solar measurements. And they're taking the measurements to the lab. And then we do this report that tells you month by month whether that's suitable or not. OK, then we say, mm, why are we using concrete foundations and all kinds of things like that? Not good. The university is not going to let me destroy parking lots. So we thought, OK, based on the concept of putting paintings on the wall, why don't we use crews you know, as a harnessing system? That's the engineering. I won't go through it, seven pages of it. So I guess you put four screws in the ground, then you put the uh, uh, necessary metal, and off you go. You got a solar charging station. Always when you're working on design and in buildings, you have to have parameters before you actually do anything. So you can know whether you succeeded or you failed. Uh, and both are important. To success and failure are both important. In Canada, we aspire too much to success and frown upon failure. Uh, that's something else we need to. Failure is good because it teaches you how not to fail again. Um, and there you got uh, one of my students. The one in the left is from Chile, uh, trained uh, in the best places in the planet. I can get into that if you want to. And Mustafa. And in Ontario, I don't know, in BC, you have to put a sign when you're doing construction. And I figured danger due to culture because that's the danger, right? So they say in English, uh, measure twice, cut once. So they were measuring. Uh, of course, you need to do an assessment of uh, natural gas pipelines, fiber optics, all kinds of things. And the site we chose, it's right by the president of the university. So we bring a gigantic drill. We drill, we make holes like that four times. Uh, then we get the screws, we screw. <laughs> And there it is, uh, torque it at the very end, clean it up so it looks nice. And then we start putting the metal. And we did it like the Egyptian pyramids, you know, by poles. Because we didn't want to use cherry pickers, because what we're trying to demonstrate is that this can be done anywhere in the planet. Don't need special machinery, uh, other than the screwdrivers. Um, and there you have it. We started making sure that it looks nice. 
and there is uh, Bastian and Mustafa making sure that symmetry is present because the president will be looking at this. His office is all the way up there. <laughs> and the eye of the human does not like uh, asymmetry. And there we take a little pause, we take a little selfie, and there one of my students came from India to study the same piece. Is there any storage, either on the grid or in batteries? I'm coming, I'm coming. Okay. <laughs> so then, uh, by the way, that Indian uh, student is very famous now. Um, and there's a single line diagram because, yes, there is storage. That's exactly what we wanted to do. That's a uh, uh, virtual reality movie. You can look at CUB in the internet, CUB, Canadian Energy Container Ice Unit Batteries. Non commercial, but uh, it's really nice animation. So there it is. Uh, we did the same thing, but in small. Uh, so uh, there are uh, eight batteries of 320 ampere hours each of grid, or not grid connected. Um, and then we make it look pretty, because why would it make it look ugly? Um, those boxes are made right there in Guelph, Ontario, and the banners are printed in the bookstore of your <coughs> university. And there it is, the president of the university, the minister of transportation, and my dean cutting the ribbon. Notice the night before we were working very hard. <laughs> uh, and there it is, happy electric vehicle charger uh, happening. And then you get the occasional squatter, uh, these Tesla <laughs> vehicles. Man, they take so much electricity. Uh, and it's free free electricity, so they, they really, I'm not gonna show you this small design of that time. This is what it matters. So I wanna show you what happened to the students that came to do these things. They came to study and learn by doing, right? So we have a collaboration, I'm sorry, I'm missing the L, between our university and a university in northern Chile in a city called Arica. And there's uh, Pablo and Priscilla, which we all co-own this company called Solar Trust. And I want to show you what we do. This is the video, if you can show it. So this is the city on the northernmost part of Chile, in the limit with Peru. And you can see it's pretty pretty good for solar. It's very arid. This is called the Atacama Desert. Nothing nothing grows unless you're close to these two rivers. It's good to see two rivers. I'm so sorry. Thank you from here. It's good to see that. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, there is two rivers that come into this city. Why do I mention that to you? Because we have a uh, collaboration program with the island of El Hierro, the Technological Institute of the Canary Islands, because we're investigating how to do hydroelectric reservoirs in this city, because we want to make the first solar city in Chile. So then we installed the first solar charging station for electric vehicles of Chile, even though there's no electric vehicles at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're ready for when they arrive. Uh, in fact, they just arrived. Um, and you can see there's not that much solar at all in this city. This is a low-income city. And we've been doing for-profit projects to be able to do not-for-profit projects. So this one is for-profit. It was a lady that had a little money and said, I want to grow olives, so I need to have green irrigation. And instead of going to Europe or buying an electric car, I'll hire you guys to put solar. Um, that allows us to do this solar installation with a First Nation. Um, and look at how arid that is. I know it doesn't look very inviting, the water, but it's for growing tomatoes, not for Sweden. And now the First Nation can grow tomatoes, which they sell to the supermarket, and they're making really nice livelihood before they were very, very poor. This is another person that say, okay, I believe in you uh, folks. And you can see the neighbors don't have solar, but she put solar. This one was for profit, because we learned by doing, right? Uh, and these for profit allow us to do the ones that really matter, uh, which is uh, Chile's uh, first solar high school. Um, it's called Pablo Neruda. Uh, so we got, after we did this project, the foundation said, okay, uh, we'll back you up. And we chose the poorest school in the poorest city in Chile.